Good evening. This is GRTS News at 2200 hours with me, Winifred Nicole. In the headlines this evening, Vice President Dr. Badarajub hails the Public Service Commission for launching the e recruitment uh, portal. Officials of the Rice Value Chain Transformation Project convenes a field a day demo to showcase performance of hybrid rice varieties under the project in the Central River region. And find out later in the news who was the first Gambian broadcaster to hit the airwaves as celebrations of Radio Gambia at 60 takes a look at the life and legacy of one of the pioneers of broadcasting in the country. Away from home, global manufacture of the drug cocaine reaches a record high in 2020, according to the UN's latest World Drug Report. Plus 50 people died while transported inside the truck which was found abandoned in U.S. state of Texas. Well, viewers, those are the headlines. Well, thank you so much for joining us once again. We begin this bulletin with the Vice President. The Vice President, His Excellency Ali Obadarajouf, has commended officials of the Public Service Commission, PSC, on the launching of the e-recruitment portal at the Sadawda Karaba Jawa Conference Center in Bijilo. Dr. Juve made a promise visit, a surprise visit rather, at the event to support the initiative. More on that in this report by Miri Ann Njai Ajayi. The new digital project is meant to enhance service delivery at the Public Service Commission, PSC. Speaking at the event, the chairman of PSC, Lamin Samate, said the e-recruitment project will save time and money, noting that job recruitments and appointments can be made online. The challenges, as I have indicated, are numerous. But of course, um, we've seen digital um, or online uh, recruitment, e-recruitment, often referred to um, as the social The central and head of the civil service, Salimata E.T. Ture, called on government departments to support the process of e-recruitment as system enabled to promote service delay. I want to thank the Public Service Commission for taking this bold and laudable step. I call on government departments to support the process to compliance. As critical enablers, you have a role in the efficiency and effectiveness of our transition to e-recruitment. Consequently, your support will not only ease the transition process, it will also further in, uh, create an enabling environment for more developments of this nature. The Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, Usman Eba, called on the officials of PSC to introduce a one-time password, OTP, which is an automatically generated password that authenticates the user for a single transaction or login session. I think that should be looked at. If anybody is using this application, one they register instead of having the email, maybe for more security purpose, you should try to implement the OTP, which what we call in English terms, one-time password. Uh, so that would be definitely a, a, a security additional security layer. In response, the CEO Nifty ICT Solutions, Jalamang Jobate, developer of the PSC portal assured of his institution's resolve to capture all the programs as the PSC project advances to another stage. We give customers the assurance that uh, whatever application we develop, whether it's PSC or some payroll somewhere or some HR somewhere, we give the end user the assurance that we are here in case your processes change. We can always come back and change them along with you. The Minister of Public Service, Administrative Reforms, Policy Coordination and Delivery, Babukar Ojuf, noted that the creation of the PSC's e-recruitment portal has given the diaspora Gambians the opportunity to apply for jobs online 
and get feedback on the selection outcome while pursuing their goals wherever they are. There are a lot of processes out there are still manual. So if we are asking for speed, we're asking for speed that is characterized by efficiencies and effectiveness so that we have credible outcomes, we must realize that a lot of that is contaminated with human error as a result of our manual processes. That has to change. We have to digitize most of these things and that has to be done now. The Vice President, His Excellency Alu Badarajouf, congratulated the PSC officials for coming up with such a brilliant initiative. Marian Jai Ajayi, GRTS News. And now to this press release which informs the general public that the Central Bank of the Gambia, CBG, will assume the rotation of chairmanship of the Association of African Central Bank, AACB, this year. To mark the occasion, Central Bank will be hosting the Association's 44th Ordinary Meetings, scheduled from July 31st to August 5th, 2022, at the Sardawda Kairaba Jawara International Conference Center. The objectives of the AACB include promoting cooperation in the monetary, banking, and financial spheres in Africa. This is to examine the effectiveness of international economic and financial institutions in which African countries have an interest in and suggest ways of possible improvement, as well as envisage the advent of a single currency and a common central bank in Africa. On the sidelines of this 44th ordinary meeting, the association will hold a number of side events, including a symposium on the theme, Digital Innovations and the Future of the Financial Sector, Opportunities and Challenges for Central Bank Digital Currencies, the release ends. Officials of the Rice Value Chain Transformation Project, in partnership with the Africa Rice and Private Sectors, have held a field day demo to showcase performance of hybrid rice varieties under the project. They feel they also coincides with the graduation ceremony of 75 farmer field school facilitators. Modula Minsani has more on that. Activities of the day began with a field visit by officials showcasing these hybrid rice varieties being promoted by the Rice Value Chain Transformation Project under the Ministry of Agriculture a close partnership with Africa Rice so them assess the performance of different varieties. These varieties are Africa Rice varieties and uh, we, they have been tried all over Africa and they are good material that we think we need to bring to the Gambia. So we, we are here today so that farmers can look at them and make a judgment. If you look at them, almost all of them are already at maturity as compared to the the Czech variety, that is the local variety, which is not yet ready, whereas all these other varieties are ready. The day's engagement also took project implementers and stakeholders to another important event featuring the graduation of the second batch of farmer field school facilitators. Having some selected members train them and then they go back to their respective communities and retrain others, it's a move in the right direction. And in a short uh, while, you would notice that if the cycle goes around, you know, um, a lot of people will be trained. Because right now, this, uh, the students that are graduating are 75. But those 75, each one will also go and train a number of others. So, and the target is 4,500. Last year, they graduated. Uh, the facilitator training program by the project intends to improve rice production and productivity as the project moves to close the gap of rice importation in the country. It's not an extension method, but a strategy to help us to fast track and be able to help the farmer to take the technologies appropriate with that, for that matter and be able to improve rice production. Rice production because we are in a haste as a country, because we are depending on rice. And you've been trained and been given the skills to go out as facilitators to complement the effort of extension workers. A perfect chance for agri officials to remind these crop of their responsibility in moving the agriculture sector to the next level. You are the people going to 
inseminate technology to your fellow farmers. Since the start of the project, we have supported farmer field school with a good, uh, good quality seeds, that is Aurora 6 and Nerica L Lands of 1, and assorted variety of uh, uh, fat, uh, fertilizer to the farmers. The colorful ceremony graduating 75 facilitators also featured the presentation of certificates to all graduates who are expected to transfer knowledge to their respective communities. Moodula Sane reporting for GRTS News from the Central River region. Moving on, the Gambia Armed Forces GAF wishes to inform the public that it will conduct a demo of skills for the visiting and work course students from Senegal on Wednesday, 29th June in the general area of Fajara Barracks. The demo exercise will involve the use of blank ammunition around the general area mentioned. Residents of Bakau Newtown, Fajara and K Point are therefore urged not to panic and are encouraged to go on with their normal daily activities as this is a routine exercise. GRTS Radio, formerly Radio Gambia, celebrates 60 years of existence in the country's broadcast industry. The radio was established during the colonial era as the first media broadcaster of the Gambia. As part of the mega celebrations held over the weekend, our Fatumata Cham takes a detailed look back at the life and legacy of the first Gambian broadcaster, Badulo of Blessed Memory. <laughs> This is Radio Gambia, the first media broadcaster of the Gambia, established during the colonial era. In the early 1960s, the radio was run with technical assistance and expertise of personnel from Great Britain. At the time, majority of its programs were rebroadcast of those in other parts of Africa and England. Although it created its own news, educational shows and music programs, Radio Gambia initially depended heavily on the BBC for programming. As Radio Gambia began enjoying massive popularity as a debut media broadcaster, one man stood out, Badulo of Blessed Memory. The late Badulo was an excellent broadcaster with Ota Charisma, setting the pace for the pool of broadcasters that will dominate the industry in the years that followed. Uh, Badulo was the pioneer broadcaster in this country. He was employed at the information office by Captain Peters. He had a very good voice. Maybe you broadcasters would call that a baritone. Uh, he was like a baritone. You know, deep guttural voice. Highly loved. He spoke very good Wolof. In fact, um you know Demotic Wolof. You know, so so I mean I mean um, you know he had stature, you know, he was a, a, quite a tall guy. You know, hefty, you know, very influential. If you didn't hear it from Badulo, I mean, for, for the average Gambian, it was not true. Badulo had to say it for Gambians to believe it. He was that influential. The late Badulo was a doyen in the broadcast industry in the Gambia and beyond. His work made headlines around the world as many would gather at the McCarthy Square to listen to his news broadcast. Badu became the source of news and information for especially the local people as he translated into the local language the news read by Captain Peters. His son, based in the United States, Yusuf Allah, knew very little about his father at the time, but his interest in his life and his styling achievements left him with an insatiable appetite to know more about Gambia's darling, most respected broadcaster. One of the most interesting things I learned about him, about his work, was him working with Alex Haley, the author of Roots, Kunta Kinte. He helped Alex when Alex was doing his research about this book. And in fact, Alex sent him a copy of the first uh, Roots, one of the first copies. And the second thing that I found interesting was him translating the news during the Second World War, and this was between 1939 and 1945, because Sir Dauda Jawara, the late uh, president, first president of the Republic of the Gambia, talked about him in his book titled Kairava, where he said he used to run 
uh, as a child to Makati Squire to listen to Badu's translation of the news. So uh, he described him as very eloquent. Uh, uh, so, and uh, he said at some point uh, they used to go there and, you know, so, and listen to him. And then my dad would start the news by saying, Yengu Yengu Bingham Nemo Neke Saharewa. So, and later they nicknamed him uh, Yengu Yengu. Amongst his many accolades was the MBE, the member of the British Empire, conferred on him by the Queen of England. I reached out to his former colleagues at Radio Gambia, but they tell me Badu was fun to be around and that he left an indelible mark in the country's broadcast industry. I know him very, very well because he's somebody who is very, very honest and straightforward. Definitely he's a man with, uh, who is responsible for a lot of uh, people. He's very, very honest, very, very honest, I know that and very generous. Mm -hmm. Anything he has, he gives it away. He gives it away. Well, Badulo is uh, somebody who is very, very jovial. He always jokes with his staff. He is laughing all the time. He never uh, annoyed with any of his staff. If he does anything which is wrong, he will call you and advise you. You have done this. Please don't repeat it again and that will be in the private. As with many other iconic Gambians, very little or none of their works are documented. And he was wise enough to um, sort of recruit rising people who became rising broadcasters, you know, I mean star broadcasters, you know, Swabu Konate, you know, just graduated from Kansas with a bachelor's in journalism. You know, uh, in Babukar Gay, he joined. He, he recruited Babukar in '69. Uh, Mrs. Sarah Godat, who he also joined in '70 in '69, just like Babukar. I mean, people like Ibrahim Akul, Abi Juf, I mean, Sol Njai, you know, C.D. Jami, uh, I mean, Lalo Samate. All these were recruited and mentored by Alaji Badulo before he retired, and. Um, such that even after he retired, at the very, very uh, beginning, Radio Gambia had some of the best broadcasters you know, along the West African coast. As Radio Gambia, now GRTS, clocks 60, the radio continues to be the center of broadcasting in the country, serving as a passage for well-respected broadcasters and communications professionals in the country and beyond. Many of these people drew inspiration from the likes of Badulo of blessed memory. And as the radio continues to inspire lives in the media industry and with the dawn of a new era, the country is set for many more Badulos, primed and poised to build on the gains made in the broadcast sector. For GRTS News, I am Fatima Tacham. The West Africa International School, WISE, recently organized its 17th graduation ceremony for 110 students. The ceremony, as Khadija Tujalo reports, also saw the launching of an alumni. The school started with only 13 students and now boasting of more than 500 students, according to West African International School officials. The school has surmounted all the hurdles along the day to graduate outstanding students who are now supporting the country's human resource base. Patu Jukajabang is the executive director. Coming together from both the IGCSE class as well as the WAS class. So in all, 110 students will be passing out let me also congratulate them for going through a very arduous process in the school. And I pray for them that as they step on the threshold of the world outside the school walls, I hope that they will demonstrate the values and the, the core values of WISE that have been instilled into them.
The board chairman of WISE, Dr. Abdullah Toure, said the team of the event is giving back your time and being a team player, which he noted has manifested in the day's ceremony with the launching of an alumni. You make a living from what you earn, but you make a life from what you give. So we are encouraging all students, particularly WISE students, to give back to your school as an alumnus, by the simple act, we have a collection of desks and chairs. And what it's saying is replace your desk and chair for only $3,000. In September 2019, Vista Equity Partners Chief Executive Officer, by the name of Robert F. Smith, made a pledge and committed to that pledge and paid $34 million dollars. $34 million to settle the debt, the student debt of over 400 students who graduated from Morehouse College on that fateful day. And that made history all around the world. The guest speaker of the occasion, Lucy Fai Jang, in her inspiring speech called on the graduates to believe in the future and pursue their person. She shared her story on how her father tried to choose a career for her, which did not materialize. I always wanted to be an economist that brings change for the betterment of people, people's lives. I had to work very hard. Since I defied him, I had to work very hard to prove that an economist can make a difference in people's life and yet make a living. So working in the Gambia, in the Ministry of Finance, in National Investment Board, and the World Bank Group covering Africa, that um, has been a pride of mine. Um, so my advice to you is to follow your passion and believe in the future. The outgoing head girl, Hasatu Jalo, on behalf of the graduates, expressed gratitude to their parents, teachers, and school management for the support throughout the journey. The 17th graduation ceremony was well attended by parents and well wishers, crowned with awarding of certificates and awards to outstanding students and staff of the school. For more challenging life events. Kadija Tujalo reporting for GRTS News. A two-day agribusiness meeting organized by IMVF in partnership with ADWAC, NACO, Departments of Agriculture and Livestock Service, has ended in Canifin. The convergence, which targeted 140 beneficiaries of grants and agro-grants provided by the EU-funded IMVF Techify project, was meant to discuss the successes registered, as well as the challenges faced by beneficiaries so far in the implementation of their grants. The IMVF Techify project, meaning building a future successful in the Gambia, aims to contribute to the socio-economic development of the country with focus on attractive employment and revenue generation for vulnerable groups to prevent them from venturing into illegal migration. The project provided grants which focused mainly on animal husbandry, poultry, horticulture, food processing, and agro-services, such as the provision of power tillers and tricycles, among others. The coordinator of the IMVF Techify project, Joanna Martins, advised beneficiaries to promote networking for the development of their businesses. We need to know how many farmers we have. We need to know how many livestock assistants we have to see if the numbers match and if we can do it differently. We need to have our record keepings, otherwise we lose track of our business. So. Information is power, and it's a power even greater and more, um, with more potential, potentials when we share it. So probably one of the best things that we have been doing in these two days was networking, building connections. Of course, the connections, if we don't do anything with them, they are useless, but they will be incredibly useful if we use them to share information and build this power. Basiru Jata of the Department of Livestock Services, who are providing technical support to the project, 
advised beneficiaries to ensure the proper management and sustainability of their businesses. If you are given a small token, please try and make so that you make the best use of that. Then at that time, you can also assist others. It is very touching and very enticing for you to hear some of the stories of your colleagues, how, he, they, uh, how they struggled until they are today. They have employed a lot of people, and I, ex I expect all of us to be employers and not employees. The finance manager of NACOC, Patrick Mendy, encouraged project beneficiaries to save with various credit unions across the country. Think outside the bank and you join the credit union. That is the only sustaining strategy way forward. Because there is no uh, financial institution in the country who will give you a facility, a loan facility, or service that is cheaper and affordable other than credit unions. So in, while you are expanding, join any credit union that is nearer to you so that you can expand your business. The project also includes the provision of business coaching services throughout the implementation period of the grants. Alajimbai, GRTS News. Well, we will now go with a short break. The news continues in just a moment. Do stay. And over now to news from outside the Gambia. Global manufacture of the drug cocaine reached a record high in 2020, according to the UN's latest World Drug Report, released on Monday. Of the three countries that grow cocoa bushes to make cocaine, Colombia showed a slight decline, while Peru and Bolivia produce record amounts. Most of cocoa in Peru is grown in a huge jungle valley where the Andes meet the Amazon. Details in the CGTN report. This is the region at the heart of Peru's drug trade. This vast and rugged terrain on the eastern slopes of the Andes is known as Vraim. That's the acronym for the Valley of the Three Rivers, Apurimac, Ene, and Mantaro, a byword for Peru's illegal cocaine business. Patrolling in an army helicopter, Peru's defense minister, Jose Gavidia, spots hidden coca plantations. It's not illegal to grow coca for traditional use in Peru, but it is illegal to turn it into cocaine which is what happens to more than 90% of the plants. This is nearly two tons of refined cocaine, the result of a police and army joint special forces operation. It's a substantial seizure, but the question is how much more cocaine has been processed and refined in the jungle hills around here to supply the surging global demand for the drug. All of this size is worth hundreds of millions of dollars on the streets of Europe and the United States. The military top brass say each kilo is worth around a hundred times more once it reaches its marketplace. Claro. Makeshift jungle drug labs use a cocktail of chemicals including gasoline and acid to turn the leaves into cocaine. A UN report out this week estimates a record 21 and a half million people used the drug in 2020. Mission! Honor y sacrificio! But the Vrheim is also a militarized zone under a state of emergency. Soldiers at this remote military base fight the remnants of the Shining Path, a leftist armed group that fought a war against the state between 1980 and 2000. Today, as many as 300 fighters remain in the region. Their remote stronghold, this Catan, is overlooked by this military outpost. We work on the zone militarily, and effectively what is our objective? We have two, to neutralize or put an end to terrorism in this sector of the country, in the VRAEM, in the valley of the Apurimac, Ene and Mantaro rivers, and also to put an end to the illegal drug trade. 
Drug trafficking operatives are allied with the Shining Path remnants as their fighters protect the trade. The commander at the main base says government soldiers have made advances against both with drug seizures as well as pushing down the basic price of coca so it's less attractive to grow. But that has led to a balloon effect as drug traffickers and coca farmers are squeezed out in one area then pop up in another. There is definitely a pressure on the geographic space. The responsibility of the Joint Command is to move these coca leaf growers to other regions. The balloon effect is real. What we have to do is work together with the police and the armed forces, but also the coca leaf growers must be given the opportunity to move on to other crops. As cocaine production set a global record and consumption over the past 10 years doubled in South America, traffickers are looking for places to grow coca with less resistance from the state. That means indigenous communities in Peru are increasingly under threat as traffickers invade their lands. Dan Collins, CGTN, in the Vrime, Peru. Well, 50 people are known to have died while being transported inside the truck which was found abandoned in U.S. state of Texas. A number of survivors, including four children, If you can see them over here behind me in the very far distance there, they are checking the surround. Not 100% sure that they have actually found all of the victims or perhaps even some survivors. They don't know exactly how many people were inside of that tractor trailer. But as you say, it has now been confirmed 50 individuals have died. The uh, Mexican president saying 22 of them are from Mexico, that seven are Guatemalans and two are Hondurans. They're still working to identify the nationalities of the individuals. 16 people, including four children, taken to local hospitals. We now know that several of those people have died and that a number of others are in critical conditions. Uh, the law enforcement saying that uh, when they found these survivors, they were suffering from heat stroke, heat exhaustion, that they were physically hot to the touch. We are in the middle of a heat wave right now here in Texas. The temperatures in San Antonio rose above 39 degrees uh, Celsius yesterday. And you can imagine that you have dozens of people crammed inside of this uh, tractor trailer. There's little to no ventilation, so it was likely significantly warmer inside of there. Officials saying that there was a refrigeration system on this truck, but that it did not appear to be working and that they didn't find any water inside. So people likely also suffering uh, from dehydration. This investigation now turned over to Homeland Security, a specialized unit that deals with smuggling. Three individuals at this point have been taken into custody, but it's unclear what their exact connection is to this tragic, tragic event. Over now to the weather report, courtesy of the Central Forecast Office. Well, that's the news, but before we go, a quick look at our headline-making stories. Vice President Dr. Badara Juve has hailed the Public Service Commission for launching the e-recruitment portal. Officials of the Rice Value Chain Transformation Project has convened a field day demo to showcase performance of uh, hybrid rice varieties under the project in the Central River region. And GRTS takes a detailed look back at the life and legacy of the first Gambian broadcaster, Badulu, of blessed memory, 
who was among the pioneers of broadcasting in the country. Away from home, global manufacture of the drug cocaine has reached a record high in 2020, according to the UN's latest World Drug Report. Plus, about 50 people have died while transported inside the truck, which was found abandoned in U.S. state of Texas. Well, viewers, that was all we had time for in this edition of the news at 2200 hours. From me, Winifred, Nicole, and the entire news team, thank you so much for watching and do have a good evening.